Hello, uh, it's my pleasure today to have with me uh, my friend Mikhail Montesinos. He's at the uh, University of Lithuania uh, doing his uh, PhD. Um, do you want to maybe just tell us first a bit about uh, what your where your current research interests uh, are in? Yeah, sure. Uh, so. My current research interest is isogeny-based cryptography, and specifically super-singular isogeny-based cryptography. So uh, would you like me right now to uh, delve a bit into the details? Um, uh, we, uh, yeah, you know what, sure. Actually, yeah, let's just, let's do that first. Let's switch it up. Sure, why, why don't we do that right away? Let's, let's, let's get into uh, some cryptography. <laughs> All right, so let me just share my skin screen if i share my skin it will be painful you have to allow me to show oh, my sorry screen. it uh yeah it's always all right okay here's a nice whiteboard okay so i'm going to start with recalling uh some basics about cryptography before i even write anything uh, we're talking here about public key cryptography. So the whole point is that two people communicating over an insecure channel should be able to uh, come up with and share a common private key, a password if you would like, uh, without someone listening being able to guess that password. See, like it's, I'm not going to say easy, but you can do cryptography like if you and I agree on a password at some point and the password is secure, we have plenty of technique to just encrypt our messages and send them to one another. The difficulty is that we don't live in the same country, you and I. So if we wanted to start doing that, we would have to have a method to agree on a common key. That's the purpose of public key cryptography. And so, uh, a very classic approach to it, which is the Diffie-Hellman algorithm, uh, is to walk in a, a group. And first, we can talk. We can explain it uh, walking in uh, Z P, so Z over P Z. So, uh, and more specifically, actually, not in Z P, but in Z P itself. So the whole point of this algorithm is that the discrete logarithm problem, so the discrete logarithm problem is hard to inverse with a computer. That is, pick G, a generator of the cyclic group Z P star and knowing a number A, of course, you can compute G to the A. And the discrete logarithm problem would be to be able to find A knowing G to the A and G. So the, the name discrete logarithm is quite self-explanatory. And the whole security of the Diffie-Hellman algorithm uh, relies on the fact that it is hard to do that when the prime number P is very large. In fact, for P of cryptographic size, so roughly, I don't want to say something wrong here, but um, two to a power of uh, can't remember if it's 512 or like 1024 or maybe 2048, but like a very large prime number. It's impossible with common computers to uh, uh, to solve that problem and thus to crack Diffie-Hellman cryptography. So how it works basically is that if you have two people, Alice, oh, sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble with my whiteboard. And Bob 
trying to communicate over an insecure channel, they can agree first uh, on a choice of Z Zp, so on the prime number P, and on the generator T. They agree, they make it public information, they share it with each other. So if Eve is listening on the insecure channel, she knows the value of P, she knows the generator G, and then both Alice and Bob will secretly pick uh, some number A mod P minus one, and Bob will himself pick B mod P minus one. And they will exchange. Bob will send to Alice the value of G to the B, and Alice will send to Bob the value of G to the A. So Eve, who is listening on the conversation, knows G to the A and G to the B. But the point is, Alice then, knowing the value of A and of G to the B, Alice can compute the value of um, G to the AB. And Bob is able to do the same thing. But Eve, we said, doesn't know A and doesn't know B. So in order to compute the value of G to the AB, uh, well, she, she will have to perform something that is pretty much equivalent to uh, finding the value of A or the value of B from the values of G to the A and G to the B, even knowing P and G. Uh, it is our assumption that it is impossible to do so in reasonable time with a computer, so Eve cannot find out the value of G to the A, B. So, of course, all this is very ideal. Uh, there are attacks on such algorithms. There are choices of P and G that are not ideal and that won't work. And in general, nowadays, uh, this algorithm is performed with uh, the group of points of an elliptic curve instead of uh, ZP star. But the point is here that you can, in such a way, exchange a password on an insecure channel. Am, so, I, uh, am I remembering correctly that the, uh, the so-called birthday attack applies here? Uh, I remember reading something about that. Uh, however, I wouldn't be able to explain fully uh, but yeah, I think if I recall correctly, and maybe I'm saying something wrong here, but I think the birthday attack would be some sort of meet in the middle attack mm. where you try from both sides randomly to, uh, to come back to the secret you're looking for. Yeah. And yeah. you hope you're going to meet in the middle and the but the paradox makes it not too improbable, but I wouldn't be able to give any details and I'm not even sure of what I just said. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember the specific details and I'm not even totally sure if it was uh, Diffie-Hellman, but I, I do remember uh, from my uh, applied algebra course that there is a, an application of, of the birthday paradox to, mm -hmm. uh, to really uh, considerably cutting down the search space for one of these, uh, one of these algorithms, yeah. Yeah, and so in order to illustrate a little bit uh, what I'm going to say next about isogeny-based cryptography, and we can explain how this can, we can relate this algorithm to graphs. So uh, I'm going to write a graph for uh, ZP star. So first I'm going to represent ZP, uh, and I'm going to pick P say equals Five, so we all have in mind what it looks like. Three, four. And the zero is here merely for show because we're interested in ZP star, so I'm not going to show it. But so um, what's going on when we look at uh, power exponentiation in that group? Well, one only goes to himself, but if I compute two squared is four, 
then four squared is 16, that is one. Uh, I write some four squared is 16, which is one, two squared is four. Oh yeah, but uh, two to the, this is where I'm saying something. Two, uh, four times two is eight, which mod five is three. And then three times two is six, which is one. And one times two is. So I get to trace a graph of exponentiation in ZP star. And I could do that with every other element and I would get some graph. Um, and Alice and Bob basically are just taking walks on that graph. They both start from G and they take A, respectively A and B step on that graph and they end up somewhere. And the point is that it, knowing where they end up, it's hard to find out not where they started from, but how they got there, how many steps. Um, now we're going to talk a bit about the stakes of post-quantum cryptography. Um, basically, it all comes from the fact that I'm going to clear all that. So classic computers. Can't solve Diffie-Hellman. Can't solve, or should I say, can't solve discrete logarithm problem. And this I should uh, I should mention is not a theorem but a conjecture because in general we don't really know how to prove that you can't efficiently solve a problem. What is done in computer science is what we call reduction proofs. So you can prove that hard problems that are believed to be hard can be reduced to one another. So you can say things like, oh, if I can use a computer to solve that problem, then I can use a computer to solve that problem. And basically the argument is we've been trying for 40 years to solve that problem efficiently and we haven't managed. So it's either impossible or just too hard for us now. But it may theoretically very well be that someone somewhere figured out how to solve efficiently discrete logarithm problem and is just quietly hacking into your credit card transaction without saying. It's very unlikely though. Well, um, what uh, what what uh, classification is the uh, discrete logarithm problem? Like, well, like, is it like N N P complete or whatever? What I can say for certainty is that it is N P. Because if I give you a solution, it's very easy to check that my solution is a solution. So remember, we want to inverse. That sends what sends a to g to the a. So if I give you an a, it's easy for you to check if g to the a is what you're looking for. So it's np, that is, we can check in polynomial time if a given candidate is a solution. It's definitely believed not to be p. And I believe it is not np complete, no, or at least. We don't have proof that it's NP complete, and it is widely believed that it is not. Uh, the reason for that uh, is that uh, the question about the discrete logarithm has a bit too much structure. I won't go into details here, but NP complete problems in general, such as the traveling salesman, are problems where you really don't have much mathematical structure, and your best approach is pretty much to just enumerate possibilities until you figure it out. Uh, I read somewhere that uh, since problems such as the discrete logarithm have a bit more structure, it is believed that they are not NP-complete. But this is not my area of expertise, so I may very well be wrong. Anyway, my point, though, is that this is true for classic computers, but this is not too true for quantum computers.
So, of course, quantum computers right now don't act exactly exist. So our credit card tra uh, transactions still are secure. But there are, have been quantum algorithms developed theoretically in the 90s that completely break the discrete logarithm problem. We, 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 we would be able with a quantum computer to factor big prime numbers quickly and to uh, solve discrete logarithm problems quickly. So if today I build a quantum computer in my basement, I, get, I can steal your credit card info. Uh, this, of course, is a problem because well, we are trying to build quantum computers. I, I mean, not me, this is not my domain, but some people are trying. And if ever they succeed, we would have a problem. So people are interested in post-quantum cryptography. And sorry, does this have to do, my understanding is that basically all these um, uh, cracking, all these uh, different encryption systems with uh, quantum computers basically all boil down to Shor's algorithm. Is that is that right? Like uh, all of them, you can basically like that's sort of the one that you use to break all of these, or is that uh, or is it more specific than that? Mm, I think so. As far as I know, the biggest problems caused by quantum computers is short algorithm, uh, and it's that quantum computer can both factor large prime numbers, which would break, for instance, RSA and discrete logarithm, which breaks Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve crypto. As far as I know, this is the main threat and the biggest problem. However, uh, I also believe that like Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman are widely used in many, many situations. So even so only that is uh, enough to be a huge problem. But yeah, for instance, um, we don't have any reason to believe that uh, a quantum computer could help break um, NP complete problems. Again, this relates to what I was saying about the structure. While we, ma we manage to exploit the structure of um, uh, groups to solve uh, Diffie-Hellman with quantum computers, problems that are just uh, more complex that have more structure, we still can do with quantum computers. At least we don't know how to. So anyway, Shor's algorithm is already a threat large enough to motivate the research of uh, cryptographic protocols that are strong with post-quantum assumptions. That is hard problems that are believed not to be easy to solve with a quantum computer. And this is, um, such a serious matter than the N, so the National Institute for Standards. I hope I'm getting that right. Wait, how does it spell? How do you spell stand out in English? Is it with a D or T? Uh, with a D. I don't know why I always wonder in English if D or T. For standards in technology, the NIST started in a uh, a competition a challenge in uh, 2017 to find the new standards for cryptography that would be post-quantum resistance. You have several candidates, which I would not be able, and I would not be able to detail how all of them work, but you have lattice-based cryptography which I believe is based on the hard problem of finding vectors of small norms in a Euclidean lattice. You have uh, error, uh, like, okay, I'm coding based uh, crypto, which is based on uh, 
inversing error correcting algebraic error correcting codes. And you have isogeny based cryptography. Which, even though it is also working on elliptic curves, has very little to do with what is called elliptic curve cryptography, which relies entirely on Diffie Hellman, just with a different group. So these are three of the main competitors. Um, you hear usually that uh, lattice base is kind of a favorite, as in it's faster than isogeny base, for instance, and it's also older and more widely understood. Isogeny based, uh, the first isogeny based protocol was, I believe, thought of in 2009 or maybe 2006. And the protocol that is now inside the competition was uh, first devised, first published about in 2011 and then improved in 2014. And of course, keeps being improved and reworked over time because it is very new. So uh, while it's not the main candidate, it is a strong uh, candidate. It has the advantage of uh, having small keys, which mean that even though it's a bit slower than lattice-based cryptography, you have to send less data through the channel, which I think might be an advantage for um, Ah, how, I don't know how to say that in English, but uh, like small devices with little memory that uh, uh, need to connect to one another. Probably you could relate that to the Internet of Things and such matters. Anyhow, our point here is that uh, a lot of people are trying to develop new types of cryptography or at least are working on types of cryptography that are still believed to be quantum resistant. And so there's a lot of question studying the security of such protocols, especially isogeny based because it is so new. And so maybe I will try and explain quickly, roughly how isogeny based cryptography work. And I'm going to explain how the SIG, SIDH algorithm works. So SIDH is super singular. Isogeny. And our old friend Diffie and Matt. So the point of uh, SIDH is again kind of to walk on a graph in a way that is hard to invert. Here, our graph will be composed of elliptic curves defined over a finite field. So uh, we're going to consider. E over ST squared are super singular elliptic curves over the field FP squared. And there's a reason why we pick. FP squared is because it is a theorem that every super singular elliptic curve over a finite field is actually defined over the quadratic finite field FP squared. Um, so the graph we're going to consider is composed of uh, different isomorphism classes of uh, super singular curves. And those super singular curves are represented by their J invariant. So the J invariant is just a number you can get from the equation of the curve. And every isomorphic elliptic curve has the same J invariant. So you can talk about super singular J invariants. And they are vertices of your graph. And then you connect uh, two class isomorphic classes of elliptic curves if you have an L isogeny. And an isogeny. Uh, is what you would call a morphism, what you would call if you were a category theorist, 
at least a morphism of elliptic curves. That is, um, we have a group law on the points on the set of points of an elliptic curve, and an isogeny is a morph is, is a group morphism for this law, and it is also uh, an algebraic map. That is, it is defined by polynomial equations. So it preserves all the structure that we like about our elliptic curves, that they are groups and that they are algebraic varieties. And as an algebraic function, it has a degree. And so we re restrict ourselves to isogenies of degree L, where L is a prime number different from, uh, from P. So uh, some curves have an isogeny of degree L between each other and some don't. And it is a fact. We have several facts about this graph. Um, the L per singular isogeny graph is uh, L plus one regular. That is, if you pick one point, one vertex, you will have exactly L plus one edges leaving that vertex. Uh, it is um, connected. which means you can always connect two points in the graph through a certain amount of vertices. And finally, the most important and most obscure property, it is Ramanujan. Which of course doesn't mean that the graph is a genius originating from India, but um, that the graph has a specific spectral property so you would define it best by looking at the eigenvalues of the adjacent mat matrix of the graph. But what it implies and what we care about is that if we do a random walk on that graph, we pretty quickly attain a state of quasi-uniformity. The mixing distance of the random walk is short. So this is good for us. Because in general, in cryptography, you like anything that looks uniform. You like that uh, when you take a random walk on your graph and you share where you ended up, people can't guess either where you started from or, or more importantly here, how you got there, what path did you take? Because um, you can then use your destination as the public part of your cryptography protocol. And the path that you took can be the, the secret that people can't get. So that's that's our basic ingredients here. Um, well, I really love. Uh, so I mean, one of the things I love about number theory is you know the fact that I'm very indecisive and I like many different topics in mathematics. And the thing I love about it is how it all comes together, and that's really apparent here right we've got like elliptic curves which are geometry we've got you know finite fields which is uh you know algebra uh and then mixing that together and out comes a, a graph uh so we've got <laughs> combinatorics at play and then it comes back to number theory by being uh, a Riemannian graph right we're applying you know uh, applying some more linear algebra to that graph and uh, you know, Ramanujan graphs come back around and have some interesting number theory relations in another way. So very cool. Yeah, that's something, well, to be fair, I haven't worked enough in research in other fields of mathematics to know maybe it's the same everywhere, but reading, learning more about number theory and asking myself questions, it always feels like I look at a new thing and suddenly I find a connection with my master's thesis. So with something I saw or got interested in uh, years ago. And sometimes I feel like I'm obsessed with stuff I've done in the past and I see it everywhere. 
But I, I think it's just the, the connections that are so wide that you can always connect things. In a way, it's nice because it means that uh, the random stuff that you learned before can be of, you, of help to you in your research. At least I, I feel like that. All right, and so um, there's uh, hours worth of material on super singular elliptic curves. So I'm going to try and conclude quickly with a very practical uh, idea of how the whole thing works. So we're going to get our Alice. We're going to get our Bob. And again, we have Eve in the middle listening. And you have to imagine that everything that anything that is sent from Alice to Bob and uh, conversely is uh, listened on by Eve. She knows everything. She listens to everything. So Alice and Bob, they agree on a few things. They agree, of course, on a number P. They have to agree on a specific super singular elliptic curve to begin with. And they are going to um, agree on a few more things. I should specify that P is not just any, um, any prime number. We take it to be L, A, to be E, A, L, B, to the E, B, plus or minus one. So the point here is that L, A, and L, B are two prime numbers, uh, pretty small, that will help with the computation. Uh, and they are different from each other. And the plus or minus ones also makes sure that P is co-prime with both of those. Uh, so they start by looking for prime P of the desired size and of that form. They agree for a super singular curve over F P squared. And then uh, they need to find a uh, basis for the torsion points. So uh, this is getting slightly technical, uh, but this thing that I wrote is the LA to the EA torsion group of E0. That is, recall that uh, I said that uh, the points of uh, E form a group. Well, this is the, the set of points that will cancel out to zero if you add them to themselves for LA to the EA times. So it's a group, and it so happens that you can describe it as being generated by two elements, PA and QA. And they agree on the same for B. So this, again, is public knowledge. Eve knows everything about that. Maybe if she's very clever, she will pick them herself. And so Alice will secretly pick a certain isogeny of degree. I will write things in the right order. She will pick an isogeny going from E0 to some curve EA. And she will pick that isogeny by performing a random walk on the graph that we saw before of degree LA isogeny. So she gets the PA equals LA to the EA. And Bob will do pretty much the same. He will pick himself a secret isogeny from E0 to some curve EB. And he will walk in a different graph in the graph of degree LB. LB to the EB. And now they will send each other the public info. So Bob sends to Alice the knowledge of EB. And he will also send some technical details to her, which is phi b of p a and 
phi b of q a. And Alice will send the converse information e a phi a of p b phi a of q b to Bob. And knowing that, they will be able to compute uh, using their own secret picks and the public information, they will be able to compute an isogeny phi a b to some elliptic curves e a b, and they will be able to compute the same. The reason why they have to send extra info is that, uh, as opposed to the case of uh, Diffie Hellman, we're not exactly studying the action of a commutative group. So uh, just knowing uh, where Bob arrives on his random walk wouldn't allow Alice to just perform her own random walk from there and arrive at the same point at Bob, as Bob. It's a default of commutativity. And uh, while it makes the protocol itself more complex, it's also uh, what allows it to be resistant to Shor's algorithm and to uh, satisfy post-quantum assumptions. Sorry, how is the how is the commutativity failing? Because I thought uh, like the group of an elliptic curve is abelian. Uh, the group itself is abelian, but uh, the group is not directly acting on uh, the whole uh, situation here because. We're composing isogenies. We are not just multiplying by oh, elements right, right, of right, the group. Right, 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 of course, of course, of course, yeah. In fact, if you want to see the failure of uh, commutativity, it can boil down to the structure of the endomorphism ring of E. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but over a finite, finite field, you have uh, two types of elliptic curve. You have ordinary curve, curves, and you have super singular curves. And I should add that uh, there have been some isogeny based cryptography algorithm protocols that were based on ordinary curves, but uh, I think they were less secure. And, uh, super right. singular and then doesn't, the... doesn't like a, a super singular curve, isn't that the one whose endomorphism ring is like a quaternion algebra and that's non commutative? Is that what it is? Exactly. Okay. Uh, it, if you have an ordinary curve, your endomorphism ring is an order in a quadratic uh, number field, in an imaginary quadratic number field. So for instance, you would take Q and add the imaginary constant i. And in a, super, in a super singular curve, endomorphism is isomorphic to, uh, well, in general, you say in an or, to an order in a quaternion uh, algebra, but we can even say a bit more to a maximal order in B infinity and this boy right here is quaternion is a quaternion algebra and it's a very specific one the quaternion algebra of a q that ramifies in p and infinity which means that uh, if you go over the of the local field QP, uh, it's still going to be a division algebra, not a mat matrix algebra. Same if you go to R, you're going to get the Hamilton quaternions and not uh, the matrix algebra of R, R. But if you go over any of a prime number, and uh, you know you you tensor all that by uh, the Eladic number field. Uh, you will get just a matrix algebra. I don't know if that's very clear to you. Maybe I should detail a bit more. 
but that's not dramatically important. The point is, as you said, that uh, we're getting here a structure in a quaternion algebra, which is not commutative, and that brings more complexity, both in the computations, but hopefully more security. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So you mentioned before that um, one of the advantages is that the key is small. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it seems like there's a lot of data being sent here. I mean, I guess, I guess it, you know, depends on the way you, you encode it. And, and I guess at the end of the day, it is smaller, but um, uh, just with the, the last set of things you had written down, it seemed like there was a lot of stuff mm -hmm. being sent between Alice and Bob. And at a first glance, I would think that that would be a lot of uh, information, but uh, well I suppose this is relative, and I don't know exactly how lattice-based cryptography work, but mm -hmm. I suppose they just have more data. Um, right. If you want, I can check. I have the article on SIDH right here, I think. Oh, I hope it was there that they wrote something about the, the size of the keys and the compar comparison with, uh, uh, maybe it's not here, but like there was a factor of like 10, I think, between the sizes of, of the keys. I see, I see. But uh, on the other hand, SIDH is also much slower than uh, lattice-based cryptography. So mm. probably if you work operating with computer, you care more about how fast you will be compared to how much memory you will use, because right. uh, what is used by lattice cryptography is still, I think, fairly reasonable. Right. Yeah, so... Um, What's interesting about all this, at least to me, is that the questions about security of SIDH uh, lead to questions about the structure of orders uh, in quaternion algebras. Uh, it leads to questions about ideals in those orders. And those have, uh, there's a lot of structure there to, in, there to impact and uh, to, to investigate. So yeah, that's the inter interesting part for me. And I guess that can be my conclusion unless you have other questions. No, I think that's all for the moment. Uh, yeah, thanks Thanks for that exposition. Yeah, I guess that's maybe I should just say that um, someone who would be very interested in a maybe clearer exposition of the topic uh, with less potential mistakes, more clarity and thought out explanations, should look at the speech by the Theo. I can't even share his first name as it is not a secret. Look at the Theo. He gave a speech uh, in January. I think if you type some keywords like uh, pirate. And I think I think what I'll do is I'll I'll find the video uh, when I upload this and I'll just put the link in the description. Right, uh, yeah. and then people can find it through there. So uh, ah, my stylus is acting on its own. Yeah, uh, Luca de Ferro is one of the people who wrote the original article on SIDH, so he's the inventor of the thing. And I would trust him more than me to explain mm. in full details mm. what it is. Right. If anything, if anything I said contradicts anything he said, listen to him. Right. All right. Okay, so let's uh, let's get into well your your journey to being interested uh, in in all of this stuff. So uh, you uh, it, you grew up in France, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I lived almost all my life in France. I grew okay. up there. I was born there. Right. So um, yeah. So how? How did you get first interested uh, in mathematics? Were there uh, particular people or, or books uh, that, that helped get you interested? Uh, did, you, did you start at a young age? Were you a, a, a late bloomer, as they say? How, how did that happen? Well, I should begin by disclaiming that uh, both my parents are secondary math teachers, mm. secondary school math teachers. So um, you could say, I guess, that I was born in it. Like, it's not like um, 
they didn't force anything on me, but mm. math was always something uh, friendly, you know, that was around. Like my dad had a few fun books about math uh, mm. that I could read when I was growing up. I'm not talking research stuff, but like uh, game books. I remember one specific book that I really liked when I was a kid. Uh, it's a French book, of course, uh, and I don't think it has been translated. It was called uh, The Labyrinth of Mathematics, and it was kind of a choose-your-own-adventure book, mm. you know, where you make choices and all. And there was a little story about kids going to look for their math teachers, and they have to go through tunnels and st solve math riddles. And of course, you would be asked yourself to solve math riddles, and maybe if you would get, would get it wrong, you would have bad ending. And if you if you would figure everything, you would get to save your math teacher. Mm. Wow, that, that's really cool. I really like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that's a very cool concept for math education. Actually, I try to reproduce it in a small way. Uh, we, we can come to that later, but I was a high school and middle school teacher for a year. Mm, right, um, it right. happened actually last year. So uh, the health crisis, the, the COVID crisis that we have today mm. happened while I was doing my only one year of secondary education. And I had to figure out ways to keep my students interested in the material, even though we're teaching from a distance. Right. And I tried to replicate that book, like to make my own little choose your own adventure uh, story on the website. Um, it's hard for me to measure how it impacts students, but at least I had a lot of fun making it. Mm. I think for uh, education with children, it can be a good method. At least for me, when I was a kid, it worked, it was engaging, it was fun. And it got me interested in solving riddles. Right. Um, yeah, so then I grew up like that. Uh, I enjoyed doing math, but I didn't necessarily plan to become a mathematician. Uh, actually, when I was in high school, uh, my ambition was to go into medical school. Mm. And it's only in senior year that I had a class on modular arithmetics. Mm. And that I suddenly decided, well, this is great. I don't care about med school. I just want to mm -hmm. learn more about that. <laughs> so I went into math for my undergrad. Mm. And then there was another turning point because I went into, um, okay, uh, undergraduate education in France can be kind of chaotic. Like uh, you have many different types of structures. Mm. Uh, you have public universities, uh, stuff that you would call BTS, EUT, lots of uh, acronyms. And we have this thing called PREPA which is a two years uh, undergraduate program yeah. that basically covers uh, what you would see in the first two years of undergraduate, but both in math and physics. Yeah. And with some minor uh, in a topic, which is either engineering or um, computer science. And you add a little bit of uh, philosophy and English language to uh, for flavor. And you end up with an intense two years program that prepare the students to take competitive exams that usually uh, allow one to enter uh, French engineering schools that mm. we modestly call Grand École, which means great schools. Um, of course, I, well, of course, I didn't originally intend to become an engineer, but it so happens that there's uh, four schools in France, which are called the uh, École Normale. So normal, superior normal schools, mm. which also recruit on that competitive exam. And they have very good reputation, including in mathematics. And this is why I went through that program. After two years, however, I passed the competitive exam the first time. And I was accepted in some pretty good uh, engineering schools, but I wasn't, I didn't perform well enough to get into Ecole Normale Supérieure. So then came the question of whether to try again. One is allowed to take one more year to prepare the competitive exam and try again. Or to just join an engineering school. Um, I was tempted to uh, just go into engineering instead. I was thinking, ah, I worked hard already. This is a good school. 
I can do applied mathematics. Mm. Um, and over the summer, I was at home and I found that book that uh, we had gotten from uh, uh, basically helping a friend of my dad move. And it was again a French book that hasn't been translated in English. It was a pop, pop math book on the paradox of Bernard Tarski, uh, yeah. which explained with a fairly simple language uh, what is the Bernard Tarski paradox and uh, how you prove it. Right. Uh, I read that book. It's a very small book, like it reads in like one hour, one hour and a half. Yeah. And after I was done, I, I just thought, what am I doing? Of course, I want to do math. <laughs> and so uh, the same day, I sent my refusal to that engineering school and enrolled for one more year of Preva. Mm. Um, and I managed to get into one of those normal superior schools, so I managed to pursue my education in math. And from then on, my way was pretty much set until further events of doubting and then coming back to mathematics. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you you mentioned you spent some time uh, you spent some time teaching uh, last last year. Um, yeah. But so what? Uh, so that's how you got into mathematics. Um, and I, I guess you. So you mentioned that modular arithmetic was sort of one of the first things that really caught your attention. So, um, and, and I know, so you were planning, when I first started talking to you, you were planning on doing a arithmetic geometry and uh, Diophantine type stuff. Um, well, an Adelic version of it, but so how did you, how did you get interested in that? Like during your undergrad education, was there someone that, um, uh, you know, was there particular classes that pushed you in your direction? So, yeah, how did how did you get interested in that? Uh, slash, how did you end up uh, in Lithuania? Um, oh, those are uh, questions that are both related and that have pretty different answers. Mm -hmm. um, so, first, I'll talk a bit about how I ended up in Lithuania. Uh, because it relates more to uh, facts of life than about facts of mathematics. Mm. Uh, basically, after I was done with my master's degree, I, um, well, I had other troubles with my personal life that uh, sent me to uh, interrupt my math career or my math mm. education for a while. Mm. I uh, was about to get into a PhD program and uh, cancelled it. And um, I left to Lithuania for a European volunteering service, which is a European thing uh, people can do from uh, between 18 years old and 30 years old, where you go and volunteer in another European country, but some extra European countries like Turkey and Israel also participate to it. Mm. And you do some sort of volunteering service. There you are, uh, you get a place to live and some money for the food. And yeah, you just get to live in another country, discover stuff. And so I kind of did that very quickly after I decided to stop. I had to find something to do and I wanted to travel. This felt like a good idea because I would feel a bit more useful than just traveling. And uh, so I ended up pretty randomly in Lithuania, actually. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed living there. I met uh, the woman who would later become my partner mm. there. After that, I came back to France for a year, which is when I was a high school teacher. And on a common agreement, we both decided to go back and live in Lithuania, again, for reasons that don't relate to mathematics, but to right. personal life. Right. Because those are the kind of things that happen when you are in an international couple. Mm -hmm. So uh, then I looked into around that time that we decided to go back to living in Lithuania, uh, raised the question for me of what to do. I wasn't sure back then that I wanted to go back into mathematics. I considered many options, teaching French language in Lithuania, teaching mathematics in, Lit in Lithuania. But as is often the case in my life, I woke up one morning and thought, hmm, I think now I would go for a PhD. Mm. 
And on that day, I made the decision, researched universities in Lithuania, started sending emails to professors in Vilnius University, ordered uh, two or three textbooks online to get myself back into it. Mm. And just like that, I was back in it. So that's about how I ended up in Lithuania. And you can see the relationship with my the uh, the evolution of my research interests. So uh, first, I should specify that uh, even though I care about arithmetic geometry, uh, my master's degree was entitled Arithmetic Geometry. Uh, other mathematicians in Lithuania do not do uh, arithmetic geometry. Hmm. In fact, there is only one or two people, I think, in Lithuania that do algebraic geometry, and those are things a bit more applied, not very much related. Uh, people do number theory in Lithuania, but of a different kind. It's more Diophantin analysis. It's a different school, it's a different thing they do. So on a common agreement, even though I joined uh, Vilnius University to do my PhD, uh, it was well understood from both sides that if I want to do my research in arithmetic geometry, mm. I would have to, well, uh, take care of all the technical parts on my own because uh, there is not a researcher there to uh, advise me on that subject. Mm. Um, when we first met and I was talking about uh, Adelic aspects of Arakelov geometry, that was the result of my random walk in the arithmetic geography bibliography. Mm. Ge uh, arithmetic ge geometry, sorry. Arithmetic geography sounds interesting, but I have no <laughs> idea what that is. Yeah, when that field gets invented, uh, maybe I'll take a look. Arithmetic geography. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I started performing a random walk in the bibliography on the topic, which is huge, vast, and spooky. Mm. And after a few months and a few emails exchanged with former professors of mine, came the realization that doing on my own a PhD in arithmetic geometry was probably setting myself, myself for failure. Mm. Uh, I believe it is a field where you truly need uh, the advice of someone knowing what they are doing and uh, where to find interesting problems that are relevant, accessible, and uh, that would do good, good topics for a PhD. Right. So, well, I think we were talking about uh, the other week when we were chatting, uh, you know, we were talking about the fact that in algebraic geometry, there's so many, there's so many times where you think you understand something and then some theorem or result comes along and all of a sudden you're like, oh, actually, I don't really get this. And like, that's the main tool of arithmetic geometry, right? So um, yeah, I, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I believe that uh, it's because of the level of abstraction of the objects you use in, mm. in algebraic geometry. At least if you go, uh, if you use schemes, if you use varieties, it's a bit more sound. But as soon as you're going to use schemes, there's a huge layers upon layers of abstraction. Um, uh, the rabbit hole goes very, very deep. So you need, I believe, years of regular practice to be confident enough that you can trust your intuition. Hmm. And so until then, you're left with that spooky feeling of not fully knowing what you're doing, hmm. having to very often check your reference textbooks for basic definitions and theorems that you kind of forgot or you're not sure if that star is up or down or things like that. Hmm. It's also part of the fun, so. Right, yeah. But um, yeah, it came to me that uh, I it wouldn't do to uh, just keep looking for some pure topic. Hmm. And so under the sound advice of uh, my former professor, I turned uh, myself towards applied arithmetic geometry, mm. which at first sounded a bit weird to me, but I knew about two topics that could uh, fall in that category, which are uh, cryptography and uh, error correcting code theory. Mm. 
So I looked a bit into both of those topics and that's how uh, I came upon isogeny-based cryptography, mm. which sounded like something very, pretty interesting to me. I had, had just gotten very interested into the details of elliptic curves. Uh, so it felt like, yeah, something good to read about. And then the more and more I read about it, the more I feel interested. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I mentioned um, that orders in quaternion algebras play a big role in uh, those issues. And uh, it just so happens that I did my master's thesis on topics relating to central simple algebras and therefore also to quaternion algebras. Mm -hmm. So I find connections there. Uh, I find things that I enjoy doing both on a theoretical level and that feel motivated on a practical level, which means mm. I can find problems that I know are interesting, that feel at least accessible. Mm. Because the field is young, there's not too much bibliography. There's still a lot of stuff to read because lots of right. people and very competent people are working on it. So there's lots of complicated articles to read, but not too much. Right. Right. So it felt like kind of the, the stars were just lining up and I had a subject I could try and tackle on my own. Mm. So I think, uh, I, I think uh, the, these next couple questions were sort of answered uh, to some extent already, but um, I was wondering if maybe you could um, highlight a, a, a specific struggle that you faced in your mathematics journey and how you overcame it um, slash, you know, what, what are some maybe some highlights and some lowlights of your mathematical career? Uh, yeah, well, I think most of my struggles in my mathematics journey, well, there's a real struggle right now of, uh, finding direction and problems to, to care about. And I believe uh, right now there's a huge struggle about confidence. Mm. Uh, I began my PhD recently, and of course, it takes some time to truly get into the research, get into uh, finding results that you will be able to publish mm. and until I can secure one satisfying publication. I will definitely have uh, well self doubt about my ability to do so. Mm. I believe I I'm probably probably not the only one among PhD students to feel like that. But this is uh, something challenging. But otherwise, most of the challenges, most of the difficulties in my math careers, were um, how do you say, more about my own development, my own personality, mm. uh, my own personal life than about, about mathematics themselves. At some points I had all the stuff going on in my life and I couldn't dedicate to mathematics. Mm. Um, sometimes I had motivation issues. I shouldn't advert, advertise that too much, but uh, I don't think I was very serious uh, during the end of my undergrad studies and the mm. beginning of my master's degree. Uh, I was still serious enough that I <laughs> managed the tests and that I learned stuff, but I was not as serious as I wish now that I would have been. Right. I feel that I wasted a lot of time. Um, it took stepping back for a few years, uh, moving around, living my life, growing up to be able to come back to it and be productive and dedicated to it. Mm. Yeah, I find I find that uh, seems to be more and more the case with people I talk to these days. Um, you know, I, I I myself, you know, early was a little different. Early in my undergrad is when I. I yeah, I didn't take things seriously enough, and I really wish I had. And um, but yeah, it's the same in the sense that you know I took I took some time away and did some growing up, and it wasn't until after that that I went, oh yeah, this is a thing I want to commit myself to, and I'm finding I'm having that conversation more and more often 
uh, with people, yeah, coming a bit later, you know, taking some time away and, and not coming back to it uh, until after. Um, so if you, uh, if you weren't a mathematician, if you weren't doing mathematics, uh, what would you be doing instead? Oh, there's a lot of answers to that question. Mm. The most obvious that I mentioned before was that I would have gone to medical school. Right. So hopefully I might have become a doctor. I don't know if I would have managed or not. Right. Uh, but, but if, this... uh, so, so, so that, that was a while ago though. Like if, mm. if tomorrow someone came and said, uh, look, you're not allowed to be a mathematician. Uh, you're not allowed <laughs> to work as a mathematician in any country in the world. Um, like what would you still would you consider going back to med school or or would you try something else? Well, if I had a time machine, maybe. But uh, now I feel it's a bit late to me to engage into medical medical studies. Mm -hmm. uh, no, one of my fantasies, if I fail at math, is to uh, learn a craft. I believe I could do very good wooden furniture. Mm. Um, or maybe I could carve stone or something like that. Well, have... ba hey, ba based on your background, it seems like you've got a, an eye for for some nice design in that sense. Your your Zoom background. <laughs> I mean. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I did carve it myself. This is my flat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm. I'm a bit of a dreamer there. I, I think a good illustration for it would be that, well, I was a high school student back then, but I think the main reason I wanted to go into med school was because I was really into the TV show Scrubs at the time. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder, I wonder uh, how many people that, that prompted to go into med school. Yeah, probably more than just me, but I think it's a constant throughout my life that, uh, uh, it's very easy for me to romanticize stuff and to imagine myself doing all sorts of jobs. You know, when you're a kid, you dream about being, I dreamt about being a paleontologist, an archaeologist. Right. Uh, but even nowadays, you just get me started on a job and it's very easy for me to dream myself into that job. Of course. Well, I mean, we're, we're mathematicians, right? We, we, we get paid to dream about fantastical things all day long. So yeah, it's no surprise. True. It's very easy that we get carried away dreaming about other, uh, other things. Yeah. But yeah, I guess that's my answer to, that, to your question, though, that I would pretty much do anything. An example I will give is that when I get, went back to France and started looking for a job, I found a teacher job, but one of the positions I applied to was uh, to walk in a cemetery and walk with uh, funeral ceremonies and mm. uh, stuff like that. Mm. And I again saw the position and it's probably not such a pleasant job, but I automatically started romanticizing. Mm. It's so much that I applied and I was a bit disappointed when they didn't call me back. Mm. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering then, do you, uh, would you be able to summarize uh, any advice you might have for uh, people interested in mathematics or, um, you know, someone considering doing a bachelor's or maybe someone considering doing grad school even? Um, yeah, what's, what's some general advice you would have? Uh, and uh, alongside that, uh, if there's any sort of uh, uh, journals uh, con or conferences uh, that, that you would recommend people interested uh, with similar interests should keep their eye on. Mm, yeah, well, um, so for the first one about general advice to people undertaking a bachelor of grad studies in mathematics, I'm thinking it's good to keep some uh, perspective on things uh, to, how to say, keep an interest in that. Like, uh, 
at some point in undergrad, you have to do stuff like calculus, linear algebra, pretty technical stuff that, um, well, if you care about becoming an engineer, it's going to be your bread and butter. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you care at least a little bit about that. But if you're in for the cool, weird math stuff, uh, at some point it can feel a bit maybe repetitive. Mm. It can get you to wonder a little bit what you're doing there. Uh, so keep on the side reading about cool math. Mm. Maybe you don't have time to pick up a textbook and walk through it. Uh, maybe that's too much, but read some pop math or watch some good YouTube channels. Uh, well, <laughs> like this one, for instance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We can do yeah, a bit I, of shilling when we're at it. I have to say, I you know, I really agree with that advice too, particularly um, like I came from a, a smaller university and uh, every every professor there except for one uh, was basically in the field of combinatorics. And mm. I mean, they were all, you know, I, I, I had some great profs there um, you know, some great learning experiences, but, uh, it's sort of limited in the scope. I mean, obviously, you know, they know about many other structures and, and, and there's a variety of classes, but, um, only, only so much breadth possible if, if basically everyone's in combinatorics and, um, you know, I, had I not explored, um, what else was out there on my own, I, you know, I would probably be in combinatorics myself. Not that that's an issue, mm. um, but uh, there's, yeah, there's lots out there and it's, it's good to read ahead, even things you don't totally understand, you know, and sort of get an idea of like what it is you think is cool and, and just expose yourself to the different kinds of math that are out there. Cause there's so much, uh, so many weird things going on. Yeah, um, oh, you're breaking up a little bit. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you, yeah. Okay, and I can now hear you. Yeah, um, the point is um, keep that flame for what is going. Remember that uh, if you're going to go into mathematics, and especially if you're going to go into pure mathematics, it has to be because you like it, you know, because it's a hard path, it's hard to get a job, it's hard to do research, so you have to do it because you enjoy it, because you want to be there. Mm. Um, this is also a passion that you have to uh, feed by reading books, listening to talks. If you are lucky enough to live in a city where, there are, where there's a lot of mathematical social life, mm. go to talks, go to seminars, go to events, look at online seminars, mm. like, keep bringing in your life stuff that will spark your interest um, and also it goes kind of with it if the flame is dying if right now you don't really feel it well maybe take a break mm. uh, that's what i did i don't know how sound that advice here is uh, regarding uh, career i don't know how much it would hinder someone I guess I'm going to find out, <laughs> but uh, it's more of a life advice. Uh, take some yeah. time, maybe things will evolve, maybe you will change your mind, grow a new perspective, get to know something else. Uh, I know I tried teaching, I guess while I enjoy it, I think high school teaching is not my way, but I tried it. Mm. I traveled, I saw other things and I have never been as motivated to do mathematics as I am right now. I have never worked that hard on mathematics mm. because right now I know fully well why, why I'm there. I want to be there. I am, I'm the captain of that ship. Mm. <laughs> Before that, I was kind of letting myself be carried by the train of going into math education one year after another, one class after another. Right. And I lost the point. So yeah, keep the point. If you lose it, don't hesitate to go somewhere else. There's a lot of other stuff to do in, math, uh, in life other than math. And maybe come back to it when you will miss it. Mm. 
Yeah, I guess yeah, it's I think, a little piece of advice. I, I think that's one thing, you know, I, I mentioned in the last interview that uh, I very often think about, you know, uh, uh, even though I've applied to PhDs, you know, I sometimes think about uh, leaving and going into industry or, or trying something different altogether. Um, but, you know, one thing that, that constantly uh, keeps me on this track is I, I find myself uh, in my spare time, I'm still doing math. I'm still looking up math. I'm working on my own problems or reading someone's article. And there's no, you know, it's not, I'm not being prompted. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not related to my thesis or anything, you know, and it's like daily, I'm always finding myself exploring these things. And it's like, yeah, clearly, I love this. I love doing this. So, yeah. I would say right now, the reason I'm pursuing a math career is because I strongly believe that even if for some reason I couldn't pursue it and I had to do something else, mm. I would still do math on my spare time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how hard I would work on it. I would probably not be able to publish research without a whole structure mm. and free time to dedicate to it, but I would still probably read textbooks. I would still want to learn stuff. Um, I feel like if I wasn't feeling like it, there would not be a point in going into research. Of course, the fact that you can get paid for it helps, but you have to be driven by something. Otherwise, it's not worth either the struggle, the effort, the risks. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, the, the final question I, I always like to uh, ask in these interviews is, probably the the uh, biggest one. Uh, where do you stand on uh, uh, the debate of uh, Platonism versus realism? Do you think uh, do you think all <laughs> mathematical structures exist? Do you think there is a, an ideal world of, of forms? Uh, um, yeah, what, what, what's your take on, on Wigner's unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics or do you just think it's uh, uh, a consequence of a of a constructed language. What's what's your take on all that? What's your philosophy? Mm, well, on the question of Platonism, Platonicism versus realism, the thing is, I tend to summarize maybe my belief by saying that uh, we invent the mathematical object, mm. but then we discover their properties. Mm. Uh, like the reason we are studying groups is sure they arise a bit naturally when you ask yourself specific questions mm. but someone had to lay out the definition of what is a group mm. and quite often with some objects like rings for instance you have debate uh, does a ring has has to have unity mm. uh, or not to be a ring uh, does a field have to be commutative or is this group is a skew field a field or not? Like a difference in definitions. Uh, right. Of course, don't. It's just the question of the words we put on the stuff. But it shows to me that, um, like the those objects, they are invented. That's why you're able to say that something is a Galois group, mm. Galois group, because it was invented by someone. But right. then, of course, once you lay down the definitions, all the properties, I believe, are discovered. Uh, so. If I had to imagine a platonic world of ideas, I'm going to think a bit like a logician and imagine that uh, those things are like all the possible definitions of all the possible mathematical objects. Mm. So probably that would be a very chaotic world uh, like, well, strings of letters in the English language. Right. And then you pass for strings that actually mean something mathematical. Right, and you have your platonic word, and then we discover rules over that word. Mm. Um, as to the question of the unreasonable efficiency of mathematics, it's also a question that I've wondered about, like many of us, I suppose. Uh, and, mm. Well, depending on the, on the day and the weather, I have different opinions, I guess, on that question. Hmm. I think a lot comes down to the power of K 
calculus originally, mm. which allowed us to linearize a lot of problems. But it also shows how artificial it kind of is. It's kind of like we have one mathematical thing we understand very well, and it's linear problems. Mm. And then a lot of mathematics is turning harder problems into linear problems. Uh, that's what calculus is about. Linear algebra is the study of linear problems. Uh, if you look at what we do in applied mathematics to physics, there's a lot of linear, linearization going on. It's a word you hear a lot. Even in the study of elliptic curves, whenever you have mm. an object that allows you to linearize some concepts, you use it and you get good results from it because we, are, we all like linear algebra. Yeah, so, I, um, I remember having a discussion with some people. Um, I was at a, a it's called the, uh, the Arithmetic Geometry Winter School uh, held by the University of Arizona each year uh, in, uh, in the States. And uh, we, there's always, a, they do a, a trip to a canyon uh, halfway through the, the week. Anyways, I remember being on the bus to the canyon and having a discussion with a, a number of other mathematicians there that, uh, yeah, basically all of mathematics, the goal, no matter how crazy things get, basically the goal is to just reduce everything to linear algebra. <laughs> Uh, and that's that's it. That's that's mathematics yeah. in a nutshell. Yeah, which also uh, allows us to give another piece of advice for undergraduate students, which is pay attention to your linear algebra classes. Mm. It's important. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I guess you could summarize my idea right now by uh, uh, the question about the unreasonable efficiency of a hammer for hammering nails. Mm. Because you know, that's kind of what we did with mathematics. We found one tool, one task, and we apply it a lot, and it keeps working. If you uh, have a hammer, you're going to be able to plant nails. Right, right. I like that analogy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meditate on that one for a while. That's good. I like that. I don't think it fully answers the question because there's another there's another approach I had before I asked myself um, okay uh, keep in mind that I'm not a biologist and I, I don't know much about it so this is all uh, armchair philosophy but mm -hmm. our brains evolved originally to make us pretty smart animals mm -hmm. because we survived better better if we were able to make and use some tools and things like that. Uh, but uh, the time on which evolution work is long. Mm. So uh, evolution hasn't done much to our brains between the time when we lived in caves and right now. Mm. It hasn't had the time, I think, to improve our brains so much, which means the potential to do mathematics at the level we do today was there before of course it took a lot of time to develop civilization and even language right. uh, to uh, bring together all the conditions to have such uh, strong understanding of mathematics right but, but in the theory, potential the, the was there capacity was there right to use a computer analogy uh, our, our hardware could have uh, could have downloaded the software i suppose or uploaded yeah it. Of course, I guess you should nuance that because we know that the brain has some plasticity. So like my brain developed depending on how I live my life. The fact right. that we have language that we're able to read a lot right. helps. But yeah, the, the potential was there. But well, you know, uh, having the potential to develop linear algebra and understand how the atom walk was not a survival advantage for cavemen mm. like being able to build tools was so you wanted to be smart enough to build tools to make fire and all but um, it feels like our intelligence developed over time with culture more than with evolution so to me there's a small question of why where did our brain have so much potential to begin with and mm. maybe my question would be answered if i one day opened a book about evolution theory or biology or neurobiology, 
mm. which I haven't. Um, but yeah, that's another take I have on that question and why I believe that my metaphor of the hammer and the nail don't fully yield a satisfying answer. Mm. Well, it cer certainly gives me something to think about. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thanks. Thanks for the interview. Thanks for uh, joining me. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It was very fun to do. Very nice. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's it for the talk. <laughs>